Hi, everyone. Eric here. Just before we get to our discussion today with Chen Yunnan from the Overseas Development Institute, I want to make sure that you are aware about the China-Africa email newsletter that we're putting together every day. Part of what we do with this newsletter is to go through hundreds of sources in English, in French, and in Chinese to filter out the noise. Now, it takes me about seven to eight hours to do that every day just by finding the right articles and getting rid of the rumors, the fake news, and all of the unsubstantiated news stories, just so you get the information that you need to understand what's going on. And on top of that, we're also writing insights and analysis on what's happening with COVID-19 in Africa and how it's truly transforming China's engagement on the continent. This is daily news curation and analysis that you simply can't find anywhere else, and we'd love for you to give it a try. You can try it for free just by going to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. You'll get two weeks free. You can cancel at any time if you're not happy, which we hope you won't. And we also offer half-price rates for students and faculty. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Okay, Kobus, today we're going to be talking about uh, Chinese rail infrastructure financing in Africa. Doesn't sound always that interesting because it gets a little technical in the development side, but it's been a very fascinating past year in that space. So let me kind of put a few topics out there to kind of set up our conversation. So the Chinese have always been seen as the country with the big giant checkbook that's willing to kind of finance everything. And then we started to see last year that they were pulling back. And it first came about in uh, phase 2B of the standard gauge railway in Kenya. And that's when it went, the Kenyans, Kenyatta, went twice to Beijing to try to secure those funds. And the Chinese went, you know what? This is too risky. We don't see a path to profitability. Then the Chinese went to, you know, looked at the Ugandan uh, standard gauge railway, turned them down the first time. The Ugandans then came back with a $26 million reduction in the budget, which really, when you're talking about a multi-billion dollar budget, is rather pathetic. But nonetheless, uh, they went back with a a smaller budget, albeit tiny smaller, but nonetheless smaller, uh, and they just got rejected yet again. The Chinese have indicated for Tanzania they're not going to finance uh, their SGR, and Tanzania itself is becoming a hub or wants to become a hub for the standard gauge railway in East Africa, and they have these dreams of SGRs connecting Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, the whole eastern region. In some ways, uh, Kenya was supposed to be that hub with those rail lines going into the port of Mombasa. Now the rail lines may, if they can get the funding, go into Dar es Salaam. One other place where we're seeing a lot of railway development is in Ethiopia. And it's not only being done by the Chinese. There's also the Europeans and the Turks who are there as well. But Kobus, really, rail is at the heart of what the Chinese have been doing. Now the key question is whether they will continue to do so in the future, given the fact that they are being more disciplined in their spending. But railway is one of these projects that goes to the heart of the China-Africa relationship, going back to the Tazara Railway connecting, uh, you know, you know, back in the 1970s when, uh, with, with, during the, the, the revolutions and the struggles, and that was one of the first big infrastructure projects. Talk to us a little bit about the importance of rail as you see it in the China-Africa relationship. Rail, I think, is is this great symbolic form of infrastructure. You know, it's 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 the perfect thing that every politician wants to be opening a new rail line. You know, it, it, it just it just feels like a long term investment, um, something that that will fundamentally change how a country works. Um, and I think in a lot of cases that that is, you know, that that is the kind of um, payoff that that rail investment brings. The problem is, it's that it's a very big upfront investment and making rail profitable can be tricky. Um, so, 
in the case of China, this this has connected to this is kind of infrastructure value kind of argument is connected to a different argument, which is the one that underlies the Belt and Road Initiative, which is cross border connectivity. So this, you know, in the early days of the BRI, kind of mid mid decade, um, there was a lot of talk about how how the the this kind of planned rail network in East in East Africa, which connects several East African countries, is a, a kind of a signature Belt and Road project. Like it, it shows exactly what, what the kind of Belt and Road could do. Now, when now that that economic times are tougher and China is a lot more risk averse, it's suddenly you know kind of the the, the downside of all of that connectivity is starting to be to be um, clear. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't diminish the dream in East Africa. East Africa is still really interested in in having you know cross frontier rail, um, including you know in order to to economically integrate the region to connect the the, the Democratic Republic of Congo to the eastern East African coast. Um, there's a lot of really good reasons in East Africa to want to keep um, doing rail, even as China is starting to kind of inch away from having to pay for it. So you alluded to the fact that this is highly controversial, in part because of the costs that are borne up front and that will be paid back over not just decades, but generations. And so that's really the, the, the split that's happening here. And this caught our attention recently because there was a wonderful article on the Panda Paw Dragon Claw blog. Uh, so if you are not familiar with this blog, it is a must read. It's pandapawdragonclaw.blog. Uh, and it's put out by some, the folks in, some folks in Beijing uh, and they do an excellent job. And there was an article called Rail Politic, not real politic, but rail politic, the strength and pitfalls of Chinese financed African railways. It was written by Chen Yunnan, who is a senior research officer at the Overseas Development Institute in London and also a PhD candidate at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. A very good morning to you, Yunnan. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So you, in your article, compared... Uh, Chinese railway development with uh, the the financing model and the development model with that of Turkey. Uh, Very quickly, why don't you just summarize some of the key findings and what you learned in terms of comparing two different ways of financing railway development in Africa and what were, as you pointed out, the strengths and the pitfalls? Sure. So... um my, a lot of my dissertation research focused on the case of Ethiopia, which is one of the African countries that you mentioned that's uh, invested majorly in, in trying to build up a national railway network. Uh, interestingly, unlike Kenya, uh, Ethiopia turned to multiple sources of funding. So the main sort of flagship project, which is also part of the Belt and Road Initiative, was the Addis Djibouti Railway. But there was also a second branch line from Awash to Weldia uh, that was not funded by China Exim Bank, but through a consortium of uh, European and Turkish financiers from Turkish Exim Bank, Credit Suisse and other European uh, export credit agencies. Um, and so you, you end up materially and financially with, with uh, a different set of projects. So... Whilst both uh, railways are designed for the Chinese locomotives that ride on them, they were built according to different standards. They use different signaling systems. The Chinese railway uses uh, Chinese CTCS signaling, whereas the European one uses EMRTS. The European slash Turkish railway was also constructed uh, more strongly according to to, um, more European norms and safeguards around social and environmental uh, impact mitigation, um, which you, we don't see as strongly in the Chinese project. And, and that was very much influenced by the sources of finance. Um, and finally, in the sort of relationships that the sources of finance engender between the Ethiopian Railway Agency, the project owner, uh, regarding both the financing and the, their relationship with the contractors. Um, and so I argued in the, in the article that uh, there's a flexibility to Chinese finance that's become a huge advantage for the ERC in the post-construction phase. So now that Ethiopia has been facing a lot of constraints in, in their foreign exchange, They've been able to defer and indeed renegotiate payments on their loans where uh, 
in the case of the European creditors, they don't have that kind of flexibility. Um, however, on the flip side, in the Chinese project, with respect to the contractors and, and the project implementation, they've been a lot more constrained by the terms and the conditions of Chinese finance. They're not uh, as able to pressure the contractors to, to do what they want in a sort of principal agent problem, simply because they don't have the same kind of commercial relationship with the contractor that they do with the Turkish project. So you mentioned the different technical standards um, for the different sides of the of these two projects. How do these technical standards, you know, how does that kind of pan out on the ground? Like, what what are some of the some of the kind of compromises that that the Ethiopians have to make to make these two different sets of standards work together? So, so some of these technical standards can be quite trivial, you know, in terms of um, the the kind of standards for the platform heights of railway stations, for example. Or uh, in one case, as a, as a Turkish respondent relayed to me, the way in which they weld the railway together, the, the Turkish contractor was of the opinion that their methods for uh, building the rail itself was of a much higher quality and they used more advanced techniques to do so. In terms of the, you know, the individual operation of the railway lines, it shouldn't matter too much because both are configured for the Chinese locomotive. The problem is more of the integration of the two railway lines because in choosing these two uh, sources of finance and two contractors, the ERC now faces the problem of how to integrate these two lines that have been constructed quite differently uh, and make, the, make that railway interoperable for the same kind of locomotives. So, so this will require a lot of retrofitting of the of the locomotives themselves, so that they can use the signalling systems of both types of railway line, uh, and to ensure that, of course, staff are also trained um, to to operate uh, on both railway lines and to understand how to maintain um, the different types of components and technologies. But this is really frustrating to hear at one level because this was historically the problem that Africa had, was that each country, depending on its colonial relationship, had a different gauge and a different standard for their rail system. So railways literally went to the borders. One of the great achievements of the Chinese is by introducing the standard gauge railway, literally the standard gauge, uh, they've been able to create some of the first international railways in Africa. And for the Europeans to come in with different standards – uh, potentially it runs into problems. Only be And I only say, I'm not trying to take the side of the Chinese here. I'm only trying to say that enough countries have aligned around the SGR. That is, uh, you know, Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia. Why not force the Europeans to adapt the, the SGR model so we don't run into this problem again of different countries having different standards? Ah, I should clarify on this. Um, so when I talk about technical standards, a lot of these apply to apply to the construction. But actually, in the gauge, um, this has kind of been a, a win for China um, because they built it first. Ah, okay, that's re reassuring to hear that they're using the SGR. Oh, that's exactly great. exactly. So so whilst uh, the Turkish built railway line, you know is constructed according to the company's experience on uh, from their background in building railways in Europe, they've actually had to adapt. So there's been a kind of path dependence effect where because you already have the Addis Djibouti SGR line and Ethiopia has pledged itself to use only Chinese bought locomotives, the European built railway line or the European finance railway line will also have to adapt for these Chinese locomotives. So so they've actually had to adapt a lot of their uh, uh, designs in terms of, um, for example, the, the, way, the way that the rails will curve, uh, the width of the tunnels, all of these will have to accommodate the Chinese locomotives. One one of the reasons that African governments um, tend to invest in this uh, in these kind of projects is the idea that they will also gain skills. That there will be some kind of technical knowledge uh, and training, uh, technical knowledge transfer and training happening for African personnel. Um, how have their experience differed? Um, you know, in, with the two different sides of this project. Mm, um so this has been a, an interesting and kind of mixed picture because on the one hand with 
With Chinese railways, and, and I think this is true broadly for a lot of Chinese development projects or, or finance projects, technology transfer is very much lauded as kind of part of the package. So with these uh, Chinese built railways, we've also seen a lot of uh, student exchange programs where drivers get taken to China to, to learn uh, how to operate railways. Um, there's a new uh, aid-financed railway vocational center that's going to open up uh, in south of Addis Ababa to train uh, new staff in uh, new engineers for, for the maintenance and upkeep of the railway. Uh, and in the case of both Ethiopia and Kenya, the two railway contractors uh, are going to be operating and maintaining the railway for the for six years post-construction. Um, so in the case of Ethiopia, this was starting in 2018. And so for these six years, the idea is that they stay on, they train local staff, and then eventually year on year have local staff take more and more responsibility. Uh, there are a lot of challenges with this, obviously. Um, one huge area, of course, is the language barrier, uh, which is especially apparent in Ethiopia, where the primary language of a lot of a lot of the population um, will be Amharic and also other local dialects. Uh, and I think it's telling in a lot of ways that the the Chinese railway construction contractors, it should be noted, are, are staying on to to operate a railway where. You know, in China, their professional expertise is in construction. They have no previous background in actually running a railway um, and and making it profitable. So uh, it, it's, it's a little bit of a of haphazard approach, uh, and in many ways, I think um, it's it's a case where there was pressure applied from from the. Ethiopian government in this case, to try and force the Chinese contractors to stay on and take more responsibility for this kind of technology transfer, because prior to the railway's completion, there clearly wasn't enough of this actually uh, on-project capacity building or technology transfer. Um, in the case of the Turkish project, since it happened subsequently to the Chinese project, we do see the Ethiopian Railway Corporation um, kind of learning from their previous experiences with the Chinese. So prior to that, during the construction of the Chinese Addis Djibouti Railway, uh, there was very little technology transfer or training taking place during the construction phase. And in some ways, this was seen as a kind of missed opportunity for the ERC itself to, to kind of build the capacity of its in-house engineers and, and technical staff. And so now they're really, really pushing the Turkish company to, to build capacity to train uh, Ethiopian staff on railway construction itself. But this operation issue is very interesting. A, a good friend of ours from the program, a reporter, Ismail Anahashi, who is based in Kenya, he did a story for the BBC earlier this year where he took a train from, uh, where he wanted to take the train from Addis to Djibouti. Uh, there was, <laughs> I think I read yeah, that. Yeah, and there was no way to buy online. So he then went to the, the train station. They, he couldn't buy it at the train station. And it was just a whole exercise in futility. Uh, in terms of being able to <laughs> to actually take the train, and it, I wonder if because you don't have you have you have construction people posing as operations people, and and there's not really a business sense to actually build this up. And this is the same complaint that's happening in Kenya as well, where passenger traffic is below expectations. Do they understand how to market, sell, and create an experience? Which is ironic in part because the Chinese themselves have built some of the most amazing, uh, you know, train systems in the world where online apps are incredible when you want to buy a high-speed train ticket anywhere in China. You go onto WeChat, you buy your ticket, bam, two seconds, it's done. And it's obviously they don't have WeChat in Ethiopia, but they can bring some of those business practices over. But it doesn't seem like it, at least from Ismail's reporting, that that is happening. Was your experience as well when you when you were there? Did you see the business side, which is so critical to be able to pay back these loans? 
Um, so I, I've taken both railways in Ethiopia and in Kenya. And I, I have to say the picture is not uniform between the two countries. Uh, in many ways, the Kenyan railway is uh, more advanced in terms of the the ease of use and the logistics. Um, it's a railway that also just costs more and you can see that visibly. Uh, so in Kenya, for example, you can buy tickets online, I think. Um, whereas in Ethiopia, yes, you do have to go to the station, um, to the booth and buy it directly in person. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure why there hasn't been a, a an online option yet for this. Um, and I think also there is something to be said for the differences between the, the Chinese contractors, uh, perhaps the lack of experience or, or the lack of coordination between the two Chinese contractors. Because in the case of Ethiopia, uh, there are two Chinese contractors, CREC, China Railway Engineering Corporation, and CCECC, China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation, who jointly constructed the railway and now have to jointly operate and manage it. Um, and, uh, and, and that has been uh, a, a source of, of uh, friction um, and, and perhaps unnecessary uh, bureaucracy in, in how it's been operated. Um, one comparison to make is, is the, the Addis Djibouti, sorry, the Addis Urban Light Rail project, which is also a CREC project, but they brought on Shenzhen Metro um, in their first overseas venture. And Shenzhen Metro is a company that is experienced in actually operating a metro system. And so um, the impression is that uh, from, from the ERC that the Ethiopian light rail has actually had a much smoother experience in the operation and also, and also technology transfer than the Addis Djibouti Railway. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. I was wondering what you made of the of the sea this um, development of China seemingly increasingly uh, risk averse to financing further expansions of um, of African rail, particularly in this East African network. You know, because um, from, you know at the beginning it was very much it was from the beginning it was touted essentially as a as a cross border like regional project. You know, more than a, a country specific one, um, and there was this idea that that China is you know not only funding rail is essentially funding regional economic integration. Um, what have you made of, of, of what seems like you know increasing kind of risk averseness in, in, in Beijing about this particular railway network? My my personal impression is that uh, a lot of these railways also like when you see this wave of of uh, capital flowing into African railways, it's quite time specific. So in Ethiopia, Kenya. Also, the initial uh, Chinese proposed project in Tanzania and also in Nigeria, they also they all took place in that period uh, in the post global financial crisis, where China was ramping up domestic investment, and and some of that came into uh, sort of had an international spillover, where a lot of these these Chinese rail contractors and construction contractors had to suddenly start looking for overseas projects. And there were a lot of pre-existing African plans and ambitions for these cross-border railway networks that they could easily uh, fit into. And at the same time, you have a wave of Chinese capital going out, uh, trying to also promote certain technologies, railway uh, and Chinese locomotive technologies being among them. Um, China has designated railway as one of the strategic pillars. And within railway, there's the strategy is uh, what has been called supply chain export, where when you sell this railway line and you construct this railway line, you are also going to be selling a package of technology that includes the locomotives, but also you know the parts, the components, the expertise of Chinese engineers and technical staff. Um, and, and so it's, it's, 
it's part of a, an export promotion project. Um, and that all happened in the sort of 2010 to 2015 period. I think after, after China's uh, mini financial crisis in um, uh, 2015, 2016, uh, there's been a little bit more of a hesitancy in, in further lending. And also that was around the time when these first initial projects matured. Um, in the case of Ethiopia, there were a lot of teething problems in the, in the first uh, year or two of operation. Um, it was actually completed in 2016, but commercial operations didn't begin until 2018. And um, in and and some factors were were uh, poor planning. Um, electrification took another year to complete, and there were a, a lot of issues with power supply because the Ethiopian government had insisted on electrifying the railway. They wanted. Uh, they, they wanted a, a sort of low carbon transport option. They wanted it to be sustainable, but it also meant that it carries a lot of extra uh, technical burdens that the country didn't have the engineering capacity to deal with at that time. Um, issues with uh, fencing as well in the railway has also been uh, a make, quite major challenge for its operation where uh, regular collisions, which is something I saw as well when I took the railway, collisions with, with animals along the route means that the railway can't really operate at its full speed and it can't you know, use that full capacity that it has technologically. Um, so a lot of these small uh, teething problems has meant that these railways are not actually making money. Um, the problem with railways in general is that, as you mentioned earlier, Cobus, that they are very difficult to make profitable. In, in fact, I think most public railway projects across the world require some level of government subsidy in order to be sustainable. Um, but fiscally, Ethiopia and Kenya and African countries don't have that capacity. So they need to have they need to generate economic returns elsewhere in the country. Um, and and some of these the small teething factors that I mentioned in the operation means that they they haven't been able to uh, fill the the purpose that they were designed for, which in the case of Ethiopia was to stimulate uh, increased exports to integrate into this network of uh, industrial zones that the government has been developing. So far, uh, exports using the railway have been very poor. Um, and so to, to come round to that, you know, China has seen that these early, these early sort of pilot projects are, are struggling. Um, and, and so it doesn't make sense to throw good money after bad if these projects are, are not uh, proving to work out. Um, in the case of Ethiopia, there was a third branch of the railway line that was supposed to continue after the Turkish project. And this was also awarded to a Chinese contractor, um, CCCC, and was supposed to as well have China Exim Bank financing coming after it. And financing on that project has paused uh, indefinitely until the Addis Djibouti project can be proven to work. So... So yes, I think uh, I think after this initial kind of exuberant surge of finance into the railway sector, we're seeing Chinese financial actors also pulling back, uh, seeing the importance of you know better feasibility studies, better forward planning um, to make sure that the projects that they finance will actually be financially sustainable in the long term. That's something that I don't quite understand because last year I attended a conference in China with uh, several China Exim Bank and uh, officials and we had uh, lunch together and they said that the key word they're looking for is what you just said, feasibility. And feasibility is this path to profitability. And, and so I'm looking here at some statistics that Germany last year subsidized their rail system by $17 billion. France was $13.2 billion. Uh, the United Kingdom, $4.4 .4 billion. The U.S., $1.5 billion. There's virtually nowhere in the world except Japan that has a profitable rail system. And so I don't really understand what feasibility means when pretty much every country around the world has to subsidize rail. Now, the logic is 
you subsidize rail because it increases economic activity elsewhere. So by bringing rail inland into Africa, in say to the Naivasha inland dry port in Kenya, you are then opening up inland Kenya and inland Africa to trade to the sea that they wouldn't ordinarily have. Now, the Kenyan Transport Association, the KTA, will tell you trucks do that just fine. So rather than invest in rail, it's better to invest in roads that can then have better trucking, which might be more cost effective in the end. Talk to us a little bit about this con- this question about feasibility, because I don't really understand what feasibility looks like in an industry that is notoriously incapable of generating a profit. So in the interviews that I conducted, there was a distinction that was raised, and this is the logic that was that was relayed to me. There's a distinction between what they call financial feasibility, which is the feasibility of the project itself, and economic feasibility, which is the sort of wider economic returns that the project is expected to generate in the rest of the economy. So I think they accept that the railway will never be profitable. And and as you as you rightly pointed out, railways or public railways are are loss making uh, making um, entities or utilities. But the logic behind uh, I think in both the Ethiopian and Kenyan cases, the logic behind this investment is that by having this railway network. And in Ethiopia, this is key because this Addis Djibouti route is a, is a lifeline for their imports and exports. They would decrease the cost of cargo and thus stimulate uh, this wider industrial strategy that the Ethiopian government is really, really pushing um, and stimulate more exports from, from the industrial zones, increase more investment into these industrial zones which will then be connected to the railway and have easy access uh, in terms of importing and exporting goods. So overall, although the railway will be uh, not profitable, the wider economic returns to to the wider economy that the that the railway and industrial zones together would generate would mean that the government can you know, pay off the loan that constructed it and should be able to pay off the operating costs. Whether that has actually been realized is, I think, questionable, but uh, but this is the logic as I see it. Yeah, and just just to add to that, one one reason that the Japanese have been managed have managed to make the, particularly their urban rail uh, profitable is because they sell the development rights to the stations, like the the kind of air rights, you know, kind of um, are, are, are kind of are, are, are awarded. Um, to to the contractors, so you know, so so that that then like stimulates development. That's that's a great point, Kobus. Actually, that's uh, that's that's also apparent in the Ethiopian case. Um, so so around the urban light rail and along uh, the the Addis Djibouti and also the the Turkish line, uh, we are seeing interest from Chinese contractors in developing new industrial zones and also investing in them. So yes, land redevelopment is is very much a part of that strategy as well, I would say. Yeah, that's like the uh, the Hong Kong uh, MRT, which is basically a real estate company that also happens to have <laughs> subways <laughs> because they sell all the development rights around it and that's how they make their billions for it. But there is, there is something to that. But these are long distance rails, the SGR, so that's a little bit harder to, to kind of do it. So if feasibility was something that was an issue in 2015, 2016, as the Chinese economy started to slow a little bit, uh, we're now in a situation where the Chinese economy has come to a grinding halt. And, and a lot of that excess capacity that we saw post-2008 uh, will now be diverted inwards as the Chinese economy seeks to get back on its legs again following the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, what do you see for the future looking at where the Chinese economy is today based on what they've done in the past and their more apprehensive kind of instincts for funding these big infrastructure projects like rail in Africa? What do you think the situation kind of pretends for the next six to 12 months or even the next few years, given what we know about what's going on in China today? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a concerning picture everywhere. Um I mean, I think we've we've seen a very immediate impact in the sort of China Africa relationship in in that just uh, a lot of Chinese diaspora and and migrant workers will no longer be able to to work in the in 
on these projects within African countries for the for the foreseeable future, and this includes you know traders, uh, small investors as well. I I think the uh, the Lagos to Kano project in Nigeria, another railway line constructed by a Chinese contractor, is also on hold because um, you know, the Chinese staff have been recalled home. They they can't stay there and they probably can't come back into the country. So so there's a sort of a huge social loss in terms of the the investment and the technical capacity that that this Chinese diaspora bring. Um, more worrying and more acutely is is probably also the problem of debt for African countries uh, who are already very highly exposed. And with this coming global recession and also the surge in the dollar, uh, I think this will also raise another question of how so many of these um, creditor borrower relationships between China and African countries will will have to be navigated. Um, in the Ethiopia case, we've already seen an instance of a sort of uh, debt flexibility and debt uh, restructuring through through renegotiation of the initial railway loan. And I imagine that this is something that's going to there will be more pressure for for this uh, this pattern to repeat um, as more and more African countries may find themselves struggling to to repay many of their external debts. But but interestingly, in your article on the question of debt, you mentioned that there was some flexibility on the part of the Chinese, but on the Europeans, they had to pay back on time. Yeah, and that was uh, that's very much just tied into into the kind of lender relationship that uh, that China has with African countries compared to you know more commercially oriented uh, oriented private creditors so in the case of you know the credit Suisse and Turkish Exim Bank consortium this uh, this is a European lender um, and there are much more severe penalties to not making repayments on time they would damage Ethiopia's capacity to to borrow from international capital markets in future. Whereas the creditor-borrower relationship with China is much more politicized. It's it's premised on a on a very strategic bilateral relationship, and more so now that Ethiopia is a is a Belt and Road Initiative partner. And so in this case, um, the Ethiopian government, I think, has has been very canny in how it's leveraged its. Uh, standing with China and this this bilateral political partnership that it has in order to gain more flexibility with repaying loans and and indeed in renegotiating the terms of the original loan altogether. The original loan had a tenor of 15 years and this has now been extended by another, uh, I think, 20 years. So, so the full repayment period will now be 30 years, which has made it uh, significantly more concessional in nature. Yeah, the Chinese deserve credit for that. I mean, there's no doubt. And, that, and that's something that the Europeans aren't doing and others aren't doing. The article is Rail Politic, The Strengths and Pitfalls of Chinese Financed African Railways. It's in pandapawdragonclaw.blog. Uh, again, if you haven't checked out that blog, you're definitely going to want to do it. It's run by the incomparable Ma Tianjie, who is uh, in, uh, in China, and then Calvin Quek and Tom Baxter, three guys who are the smartest guys you're going to find out there looking at uh, Chinese sustainability issues overseas, debt financing, Belt and Road issues, all of that over at Panda Paw Dragon Claw. And uh, Chen Yunnan wrote a recent article on it. So that's where you go and find it. Chen Yunnan is the senior research officer, a senior research, senior research officer at the Overseas Development Institute and a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and uh, pursuing her PhD there. Thank you so much, Yunnan, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Are you on uh, social media if people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days? Uh, yes, you can follow me on Twitter at Yunnan Chen, Y-U-N-N-A-N-C-H-E-N. Um, mostly these days, it's very coronavirus related, however. Well, that's what it is. Well, I'll put a link to your Twitter handle uh, in the show notes. And once again, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Kobus, there was one overriding single very important message that I took away from the conversation with Yunnan, which is the Chinese are not going to be funding anywhere near what they did over the past 10 to 15 years. So all the people out there who wanted 
China to kind of back off the funding, not entrap people with debt, as the Americans kind of allege, all of that. Now it's going to be, there we go, it's done. Uh, they're, they're out of that game. I think they're going to be too distracted with what's going on at home. There will be some, don't get me wrong, it's not completely going to cut off, but the big multi, multi-billion dollar projects that lack any path to profitability in, in, the, in the economic feasibility of them are uncertain. To me, I think that era has passed and we're entering into a new era in the China-Africa relationship that I think will be far more frugal. And the big question is going to be, next year at FOCAC, if there is a FOCAC summit uh, in Dakar, will these big infrastructure projects be part of the package? And so we don't know, but that's certainly, I think, going to be part of a more frugal era that we're entering into. Yes, I you know I tend to agree with you. I think I think it's going to really be interesting to see what kind of uh, decisions African governments make about which kind of projects they want to push and which they want to abandon. Um, I think it also raises a lot of questions about about climate sustainability in Africa, uh, because obviously a lot of a lot of these rail projects, you know, were planned in order to take to take some of the weight off the roads. You know, roads roads is its own big problem in Africa. Uh, maintaining them is expensive. Um, making locking countries into a you know a carbon dependent like trucking future it has its own massive problems, especially in in a place as big as Africa. You know, where where the where the distance is also so huge. Keep in mind that Democratic Republic of Congo alone is roughly the size of Western Europe. Um, so you know, so so there there are a lot of unintentional of unintended kind of costs that come with some of these decisions. Um, and you know, what China wants to fund and what it doesn't want to fund is going to become a really big issue in the future. I get into discussions on Twitter quite a bit with people who say, "Well, we can get money from somewhere else." We can get it from the African Development Bank. We can get it from the Europeans. Uh, even maybe the Americans will get into the space. And I just think they're crazy because I don't see other lenders kind of writing checks anywhere near as large in the multiples of billions the way that the Chinese did. It's simply too large to be able to fund this. And we're going to see a test here. So the all eyes are going to be on Tanzanian President John Magufuli and his ambitions to build Tanzania as the rail hub for East Africa. And he's got these plans which are spectacular and their rail lines, you know, flowing out all over, kind of like veins across East Africa. But he doesn't have Chinese funding. So we're going to see that as a test, as a critical test to see if he can finance the development of this without the Chinese involved. So I, I'm skeptical personally, and that's not a being a pro-Chinese thing or an anti-Tanzanian you know, Tanzanian thing. No, no, no. I'm just skeptical that the cost of doing this is so enormous. And now in the COVID-19 economic crisis area, uh, era, I just, I just don't see it happening. And I think this is going to be one of the casualties. These projects will be canceled or pushed out so far into the future that uh, I think they're not foreseeable anytime soon. Uh, very quick on the question of debt. So she talked a little bit about, Yunnan mentioned uh, how they, the Ethiopians rescheduled the debt. Do you get the sense that the Chinese are going to be in a position where they have to reschedule Kenya's debt uh, and Djibouti's debt and all of these countries' debt in order to avoid them defaulting? Or do you think the Chinese, as they are indicated to be doing in Zambia, are going to kind of play the tough card and want, they want their money back? My feeling is um, they would, they're probably going to be moving towards the rescheduling. Um, the optics of, of forcing poor little countries to repay, you know, kind of no matter what, they're generally very bad. In the wake of a, of a COVID-19 outbreak in Africa, they're going to be a lot worse. Um, so in South Africa yesterday, the government announced really quite wide-ranging plans to to safeguard s uh, small and medium enterprises, to you know kind of to safeguard the banks, to to make sure that there isn't going to be massive uh, massive job losses, and then in the process also like a lot of people falling through the little bit of social safety net that South Africa has. So that's a lot of cash rollouts into the economy. How are they going to pay for that? is a little bit up in the air. Um, and I think that's going to be true for a lot of other African countries that are going forward. Because the, the, the difference, you know, the difference between, um, you know, kind of the, the, the kind of social, the social disruption that would come from widespread job losses in the wake of, of the outbreak, you know, that itself is a scary enough prospect that, that some kind of government assistance is, will probably be needed. Which means that, 
you know that that's going to put debt repayments into a new into a new area you know um, that will and that which means that they will probably have to be renegotiated so um you know china's flexibility around this issue is going to be a key issue in in the, the entire politics of the china africa relationship for the next few years um i think i think the the crisis has really kind of reshaped everything has reshuffled everything that we're dealing with in this field um and if china comes off as the the kind of monster that wrecked african societies because it needed that repayment to be on time that will fundamentally change the china africa relationship um and that's also true for africa for for africa's relationship with with europe and with with other lenders as well um you know so so i think yeah the, the, some flexibility will probably be needed these are such interesting times that we're living in a lot is going to change in the china africa relationship this of course is what we talk about every single day in our subscriber newsletter um you know Getting good information that is fair, that is accurate, that pushes out the fake news and filters out only what you need to know is difficult. It's really almost impossible, and there's nobody else doing it in the China-Africa space. Kobus and I do it every single day uh, for people in the State Department, the Foreign the foreign Office in London, for Durko, folks at Durko in South Africa are now getting it, bankers in South Africa are getting this newsletter, the United Nations Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. I mean, I can go down the list of people who are getting it, and in part because they really want a compact digest of what's going on every single day. We really would love to have you, our podcast listeners, particularly those of you who've made it to the end of the program, to join this community. It's $149 a year. That supports me and to be able to do this as a full-time job and, and to be an independent, nonpartisan journalist. We don't take any outside funding uh, from corporations or advertisers to be able to put this on. So I make that as a plea that if you want to support independent media and this type of journalism that is so important today, uh, your support would be greatly appreciated. And so just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. If you have any questions, you can just email me, eric at chinaafricaproject.com, or you can talk to Kobus at kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. We're super accessible, uh, and people are oftentimes surprised that when they email, they get really long emails back. <laughs> so we like, we just, we're so passionate about this topic, and we've been doing it now going into our 11th year, and we love talking about it. We love talking about it with you. So please feel free, even if you don't want to subscribe, to reach out and say hello to us, that you've heard the podcast. And if you have any questions or feedback, we always want to hear that. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Uh, Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.